Hi, my name is Erin Shea, and I am here today to talk to you about my new book, Mongol Court Dress, Identity Formation and Global Exchange. Um, I'm going to introduce the book very briefly by mostly focusing on um, the Yuan Dynasty, but also introducing some new material. So here is a map of the Mongol Empire. As you see, the Yuan Dynasty is in the east. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the Ilkhanate in the west. Um, I'm not really going to be talking about the Golden Horde or the Chagatai Khanate today because we don't have the time. Um, so what I'm most interested in is how, in a very short period of time, um, the Mongols were able to sort of create a courtly idiom through dress and uh, spread this across their empire, but also into the West, into the Mediterranean, um, which we will see. So the Yuan Dynasty was founded by Kublai Khan, um, who you see here, uh, and you see him in miniature in that, in that bigger painting. Um, here is a detail of the Liu Guandao painting, Kublai Khan hunting. Um, so when Kublai founded the Yuan Dynasty, which he actually founded in 1260, uh, he needed to establish a way of showing his sort of imperial might. And um, this was going to be in contrast with how Chinese emperors had represented themselves in the previous Tang and Song dynasties. So Kublai was sort of in dialogue with these representations and the way that they dressed, um, but also uh, trying to create a new idiom. So basically he, he borrowed things like hunting dress and um, began to sort of embellish them, especially in gold. Uh, the most famous type of textile used by the Mongols across the empire was something called nasij, which is an Arabic word, which is basically a, a complex weave called a lampus um, made with gold threads. You see a detail of that here. Nasij was used to create all sorts of things, hangings, uh, furnishings, but um, what I'm interested in, of course, is court dress. So on the left, you see a Mongol woman's court robe, and then in the center, a man's robe, and on the right, uh, a bokta or gugu guan, which is what the women wore at the time. Um, so speaking of women, the woman that is depicted next to Kublai Khan here is his consort, his chief consort, Chabi. Um, and Chabi was very much an equal partner to Kublai. And here we see her wearing a type of, uh, of hunting dress, really. It's a it's sort of a different version of, of what her husband is wearing or what his entourage is wearing. Um, Mongol women wore two types of dress, as far as I have been able to tell. On the right, you see Chavi in um, sort of her formal court dress, and on the left, you see her in this more hunting style dress. Um, if we think about the hunting dress, it looks a lot like the dress that the men are wearing. So that is sort of this uh, loose robe on top that's belted um, that allows room to move um, with trousers and boots. So this was something that women would wear because they were at horses just as men were. Um, however, most depictions of Mongol women, especially formal depictions, uh, show them wearing these wide court robes. And usually actually in paintings, we see them wearing red. Um, so red, red bokta and red uh, silk, probably silk court robes. But in excavated textiles, they're usually done in nasij, in that lampus, um, gold woven lampus. So same goes with the bokta. Um, you see this bokta from the China National Silk Museum in Hangzhou on the left um, that has been excavated and that is woven in a nasij, whereas of course Chabi is represented on the right, a red bokta. Um, so this style of dress, both for men and women, was very recognizable. And this is a representation, a manuscript representation from the Ilkhanate, so the western part of the Mongol Empire. And this type of court dress was worn at the Ilkhanate as well as in the Yuan, so um, across the empire. Um, the evidence that we have for the Ilkhanate, unlike uh, the Yuan in China, in China we have excavated textiles alongside painted representations. In the Ilkhanate, um, really we just have painted representations such as this manuscript, um, which uh, shows preparations for a banquet, and we see the woman is in charge in the lower right. Um, in terms of 
textiles that originated in the Ilkhanate, uh, the, the only ones that we have that have been preserved have been preserved actually in European church treasuries uh, or in European tombs, um, which brings me to the fact that uh, a lot of these elite textiles were actually being imported into Europe and especially Italy um, through, through trade, but also through gifting, um, where they were quickly imitated in uh, Italian weaving workshops and uh, represented in Italian paintings. So um, this sort of Mongol aesthetic for gold woven textiles really impacted uh, Italian production as well. And, um, and Mongol style uh, figures were also represented in religious paintings, such as this figure here, who's actually um, holding the cloth of Christ in this crucifixion scene. Uh, the textiles were also, as I said, imitated in Italian weaving workshops. So you have um, a lampus on the right that was woven in Mongol ruled Central Asia. And then on the left, you have um, a green lampus silk that was probably woven in Lucca, and it's, it's in imitation of the sort of Central Asian textiles. So just to conclude, um, bringing the map back to show you sort of the widespread of all of these objects, just to tell you that between Tabriz um, and Dadu, which is present day Beijing, there's 5,000 miles. And then you have the other objects in Europe. So it's a really, really big extent, um, big reach for the Mongol Empire. And if we're thinking about what the lasting impact of Mongol dress was, uh, at least in China, um, we see it in the form famously of the Mandarin Square, which we see represented here, um, which lasted through the end of the Qing Dynasty. Thank you very much.